What gets me excited to come into work is it's, it's, never, it's never boring. It's never just the same day over and over. We're working with some of the biggest artists in the country, in the world, in every genre of music. The guitars we make and, and design and produce are uh, going in artists' hands that are writing the next big hits, the next, the next biggest album. And to me, that's, that's really special. It gives me kind of a connection, not only to music, but just kind of the legacy of Gibson. Every day, there's a new challenge that we have to rise to, something we're working on every day. And it's never the same, ever. But it's never been boring. It's always been exciting. But I must say, there are days that it's 80% inspiration and 20% perspiration. When it comes to fingerboards on our Gibson acoustic product, uh, we use several different woods. Historically, rosewood has been the most popular and most used wood on, on our guitars. But these days we've branched out a little bit. We use walnut on a lot of our studio models that have walnut back and sides. We use striped ebony on our G collection guitars. And we also use black ebony on our, some of our historic models that were historically built that way on our custom shop models that deem that that is, would be the best application for that. Ebony is a very, very dense wood, and that's why people love it. And it wears very well over decades of playing. But it is a dense wood, and it will absorb less of the vibration, hence, hypothetically, create more sustain in the instrument. Rosewood is a little softer, but people love the look and feel of rosewood. Rosewood is the key. We, uh, it's easy to work with, sounds great, looks good, and it's, it's just a fantastic tonal addition to any other sides and backwoods, topwoods. It just blends very well with our product and the tone we're looking for. Uh, so this machine is basically where we start the fretboard. So we have our blank start with the blank here, throw it in here, it gets the correct uh, perimeter, and then it also gets the inlay pockets here. And this is where we inlay all of our fingerboards. People that are not guitar players, uh, a lot of times do not realize that the fingerboard surface is not flat. Historically, our fingerboards have had a 12 inch radius. Some of our models like the G Collection and the Studios, we've uh, developed a 16 inch radius fingerboard that works really well for that application and that type of plank. They'll take the blank, they'll cut it to the perimeter of the shape that's needed, and then the next thing they do is they'll cut the cavity for the inlay. In this case, crowns for an SJ200. Once the cavity is cut, we will install the inlay. Glued in, still very rough at this stage. Now one thing a lot of people don't think about is we talked about the fact that this fingerboard has a 12 inch radius, it's actually curved. So our engineers and tool makers created a really cool tool that you take this fingerboard and it's held on by vacuum. There's a belt that's going around this way beneath that. The fingerboard actually rocks across that belt and actually sands it in a 12 inch radius, sands it in a curve to sand that shell down flush without compromising the radius of your fingerboard. We have a lot of different inlay packages we use on our, on our fingerboards from simple dots on a J45 to crowns to the historic parallelograms like on hummingbirds and doves. Some of the models will get binding, some of the fingerboards. It just depends on what the specifications call for and what that model historically had in the case of a J200 or a hummingbird or a dove. Square end fingerboards and the nub fingerboards, we glue the end cap on, we trim it, we glue the sides on, we trim them, it's pretty straightforward. The bird beak bindings are the same way. It's a pre-molded assembly. We prep the board, we glue it on with super glue. Uh, the higher end bindings though, they're quite a bit more labor intensive. They're cut by hand and mitered and matched that way. The racing stripes also cut by hand and installed that way as well. In some cases where they hand bind it, they have to cut the angles, line everything up, make the joints as clean as possible so they're invisible to the end user. You're ready now to install the fret wire. This fingerboard will go back into the CNC and the slots will be cut where the fret wire will eventually lay. 
Once the fret slots are cut, they go to the fret installation table. They have a, a bench, this is held down, and they set the fret wire in the slot, have an arbor pull down. Every piece of fret wire is hand set in. People have tried mechanizing this process, but the problem is every piece of wood is different. Every piece of wood has different densities, and you put X amount of foot-pounds of pressure to set a piece of fret wire on a softer piece of wood, it's gonna push it in too far. On a really dense piece of wood, it's not gonna set it in deep enough, so it's just totally a feel and instinctive thing, and these guys get really, really good at it. So we have several kinds of fret wires that we use. We have a jumbo wire that comes on a roll that we come by hand, and we also have a standard size wire that we cut by hand off the roll as well. Uh, those are typically used for the historic models. And we also have pre-cut fret wire that we use basically on everything else. The fret wire, once it's installed, they'll look down the fingerboard. And if the frets are all even, it will literally look like a mirror, a sheet of glass. If one of the pieces of fret wire is maybe a thousandth higher or a thousandth lower, it will jump out because it'll either be a dark spot if it's lower or it'll, it'll jump out as, as bright if it's lighter than the rest of them. And they go in and make that adjustment. So this machine is a, is a giant belt sander. After we, uh, after we install all of the frets here, the ends are sticking out, so we sand it flush, and then it flips up at a 45 degree angle, and it puts a bevel on there, so when you're playing, it's not cutting your fingers. When playing a, any guitar, the actual inlays, which mark the various frets, it's not really visible to the player because of the position that you're holding it. So side dot markers are installed at this point. Right now what I'm doing is I'm installing side dots. So pretty much I've gone through, I've drilled in just up to the board with the binding. If it doesn't have binding, we go all the way through. Not through the board, but about a hundredth thou deep. Then we'll install the side dots with some super glue. With these we'll do tortoise dots with white super glue and that way it just flushes up real nice. For all any nubs, they'll have that on it. This is a pre-war, so it gets a little different treatment than we usually do on normal boards. After that, we'll clean it up with a hard block by hand, get any even little sanding scratches out, give it a nice little quality inspection, and it gets matched up for glue up from there. They have a glue roller that they put the tight bond glue on, and they'll roll the glue across the surface of the neck. With those pins in place, they'll pop this in, and then they have a really unique fixture that the whole thing goes in, and pressure is applied. There's a lot of applications in our factory where we need a lot of pressure to make glue adhesion all it should be. But you can't compromise the curvature of the back of the neck. You don't want to flatten out what may have started as a V-neck. So we utilize fire hose and you can pump it up as hard as a rock with air, but it will still conform to any shape. So that fire hose wraps around the back, presses down and gives the pressure evenly across the length of the fingerboard and the neck, and it stays in there for about another 45 minutes, and it's just a constant rotation all day long on the fixed string they have uh, to get these necks glued up to the fingerboard. From there, it goes to hand sanding the back of the neck. Uh, this is one of those more critical jobs that's done by somebody who knows what they're doing, knows what the contour should feel like and should look like when it's done. Um, we'll remove any of the tooling marks using a combination of sanders. So, this hand sanding allows each Gibson to have its own little bit of personality, like no two end up being exactly identical. After that, the final thing we're gonna do is we're going to give it one more inspection and then we're going to stamp the serial number. In most cases, the serial number is stamped on the back of the peg head. It's an eight digit system that we've had in play for quite a few years actually. The way to identify the time frame of the specific instrument is the first and fifth digits note the year. In this case, it would be 2-3 for 2023. Second, third, and fourth digits are the Julian day that this guitar stamps. Say if, if, if those numbers are 145, that means it was stamped on the 145th day of the year. The last three digits tell you where it was in sequence on that specific day. Say the last two digits are 18. That means that was the 18th guitar stamped that day. Once the serial number is, is indeed put on the back of the peg head, the neck will move forward to neck fit, where it'll be joined with the body, again, utilizing our historic compound dovetail neck joint. And uh, that's the day it becomes a unit, a guitar, ready to move forward into the spray booth. The 
Bobby Gibson's actually pretty relaxed for being a fast-paced job. Uh, everyone gets along really well, everyone's supportive of each other, and ultimately everyone has the same goal, and that's to build the best guitars we can. It's a real special place to work. Uh, the guitars that we're seeing every day um, are, are people's dream guitars. We're, we're seeing these instruments from start to finish, and knowing that people are going to pass these guitars through their generations of their family. The guitars we're building are, are heirloom quality instruments. Uh, these guitars will last a lifetime and, mo and longer. Most people use music as an outlet for something in their life. And just to be part of that is, you know, something special. My favorite part of working at Gibson is the instruments. And uh, I gotta say, you know, trying to contribute. My nature is trying to contribute in whatever I do even if it's not in the building of the instrument, in the design and in the idea of the instrument, and getting it to the artist. Um, my, big, my greatest joy is, it, it's not so much that they will love that instrument, they will love the music that that instrument plays. And I, there's a music in my heart, and I've been a musician all my life, like many Gibson people, all of us big family, we love music. And the better the music, the better humanity has an existence on this earth. I love it. It's a wonderful connection to this earth.